Well, hello, Folk and Flick. How are you guys doing today? I'm happy to see you here. Glad you're clicking on my video. I appreciate all the subscribers. I have a few now, which is a thrill. And I hope that in the future I can make some content that is interesting for you. <laughs> maybe inspiring, maybe entertaining. I hope so. I want to do more stuff on location, but I've been really busy with some other projects recently and haven't been able to get out and about, but I'm going to do that soon. Anyway, I have a big project I want to throw out there now, talking about uh, trying to synthesize some of my thinking around the conservative versus liberal, the new right versus progressive, you know, uh, journey I've been on looking into that trying to understand um, clearly what my conservative and new right friends are all about and uh, also trying to understand myself, my, you know, kind of inbred propensity uh, towards progressivism and how I think that uh, the, the categories aren't that simple. And for me, anyway, uh, there are, I have conservative elements to my thought and uh, reaction to things and feelings and ideas and I have things that I that are obviously very progressive and I'm also trying to contextualize things all the time which means putting them in historical and cultural and sociological uh, philosophic whatever scientific uh, context I can put them in to think about them uh, people throw out these truisms or, you know, uh, heuristics to describe what they're thinking about. Uh, if you're attracted to a certain kind of ideology, you're kind of stuck with it in a way, unless you really want to uh, think your way out of it or around it or through it and recognize that there are other ways of looking at things. So this is difficult. I, I want to explore uh, initially this book by Burnham, James Burnham, called The Suicide of the West. And the Machiavellians. And I want to talk about Jay Dyer, who's an interesting guy on YouTube. And he does a lot of live streams that are very interesting. He's extremely bright, intelligent. He has a great working memory. He's read a lot of books. His primary expertise, as far as I can tell at the moment, is uh, Orthodox Christianity. But he's also a philosophy person. Uh, I think focused mostly on the classics, but I don't know for sure. And he's written a big red book, which I'm interested in, in reading just to see his, his uh, perspectives in more detail. Uh, he also uh, talks a lot about, um, I wouldn't say they're necessarily conspiracy theories, but he just talks about the great game, the same thing I do. I'm constantly thinking about the players, geopolitics, uh, how the the movers and shakers, the powers that be, uh, control and run the game and define the game, create the game, manipulate the game, and how all of us are just kind of powerless. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so he, he gets into that pretty deep, which is kind of fun. I'm fairly confident that he doesn't have just typical views on these things. He, he, he thinks them through fairly deeply, but still he lands on some fairly typical tropes in the conspiracy world. So, you know, I'm not 100% on board with everything that he says, but of course I haven't del delved into his thinking and his opinions on things that deeply, so I don't know. But it, it's interesting anyway. So I'm going to talk about that my own kind of personal theology um, and philosophy of life and stuff like that. But I want to bring in some other books that are interesting. Uh, the Anthropic Bias, Observation, Selection, Effects in Science and Philosophy. Uh, this is Nick Bostrom, and this is really fascinating stuff. It's a huge read, 
But the anthropic principle, many of you probably are familiar with, is a really important uh, thing to go through. And he's looking at selection bias and, and observer selection bias, things like that. Biases and heuristics, of course, very important in how we look at things. We really have to focus our efforts regardless of our ideological bent or our philosophy of life. So I believe there are things that are uh, a challenge to humanity, global challenges, global issues, uh, these things that Schmachtenberger talks about a lot, like multipolar traps, uh, are very important. Uh, you know, these ideas that, you know, uh, scientism and evolution and trying to fit these things into ideologies instead of looking at them uh, for what they are, reading the primary sources of information, learning from the experts in, in evolution, for example, the theory of evolution, and, and taking your opinion from there. I'm also interested in compatibilism when it comes to the Orthodox Church. So some Orthodox uh, uh, people presbyters and, uh, you know, abbots and, and philosophers, mystics, uh, theologians, uh, have a fairly uh, easygoing stance on various scientific and social issues. So I find that really cool. I want to talk about that moving forward. Um, because I think that, you know, trying to fit the 21st century into a Bronze Age uh, framework or, an, or even an Iron Age framework or whatever, even in, in terms of the Enlightenment or the Age of Wonder or any of these other periods of history is a mistake because we're living in a different period now. A lot of genies have escaped their bottles. There's no way we're going to put them all back in unless uh, some catastrophic thing happens to civilization, which is a global phenomenon now. And uh, it's also, you know, global civilization is about networks and interconnectivity and logistics and utilizing global resources across markets and across nation states. You know, you have to import your rare earths and your uh, metals and your energy and and utilize that to produce whatever it is you're producing. And now, you know, not even getting to the catastrophic thing that happened to world culture when social media hit. You know, in general, I feel like I want things to slow down. I want us to be more wise about how we handle new inventions, new technologies, Things are going to change, you know. There isn't a point in history that you're going to go back and say, see, for a thousand years it was exactly like this. Things have always changed. It's just that, you know, it took us a thousand generations to learn how to knit. And, you know, uh, I've, I read this fascinating article about where they had a little piece in it where they talked about the Romans couldn't knit, you know. So knitting didn't come, come about until a thousand years after Christ, right? And we take it for granted that these stretchy fabrics were always around. One of the reasons they didn't dress the way we dress in pants and, and these kind of stretchy shirts is they didn't have stretchy material. They had woven material, so they had to wear robes, togas, things like that. We take all these things for granted, you know, the, the wheel and so on, oil and gas, and we kind of think that, oh, things were really wonderful before oil and gas or in traditional societies. But, you know, these things have been changing uh, all along. It's just that it took a lot longer for certain things to change. And now we're in this world <laughs> of rapid change. Which is freaking <laughs> <everybody> <laughs> And uh, <laughs> we have to slow down and learn how to roll with the changes in a healthy way that 
you know, maintains the human aspect of our life and culture and, you know, our, our sanity, our health. And this other book about, um, what is it now? The goodness paradox about morality and violence, and and uh, you know how these things work. Uh, we're we're fairly violent in terms of going after uh, out groups, but we're fairly docile to our in group people. How does that work, and why are we less violent than chimpanzees? You know even though we have genocides and all that kind of stuff. These things aren't going to change, uh, no matter how much has changed on the surface or with science and technology. We're still human beings. We haven't evolved past the limits of our species. So, uh, you know, if you want to monkey wrench things into your religious belief, your religious dogma or whatever, you can do that. But I think that regardless whether you're Lane Craig or, or Jay Dyer, you depend on all these technologies. And uh, science understands how these things work. There's multiple lines of evidence for most things that we take for granted in physics and uh, biology and so on. Um, so compatibilism is, is cool, you know, God, I mean, uh, works in mysterious ways. If he's going to talk to somebody uh, 3,000 years ago, he's going to put out messages that are different than the ones that we would have now. So if Jesus was here now, would he speak quantum mechanics? Would he speak uh, how to design computer chips? Would he speak, you know, uh, postmodern philosophy? Uh, would he understand these things? I think so, <laughs> but whatever. I mean, he if he were here now, he'd be a modern Jesus and not a not a ancient Jesus, right? Anyway, I think about these things. I want to figure out how to bridge the gaps and talk productively and friendly with people who have these real settled beliefs and settled aversions, you know, because. We have to manage our hatreds and our, our, our competition and our disagreements uh, because right now we really do have the capacity to really destroy everything. And whether you, you know, I can't, I can't imagine why people can't understand what climate change is, global warming. Uh, they can't understand what happened after the Industrial Revolution, how that changed things, the way we farm, the way we use the soil, you know, the way we use resources, consumer society, economic growth, GDP, how these things are very, very different than anything that came before, and how we have to really think these things through. And primarily, if we live in a profits first world where the most important thing is just making more money, uh, we're in big trouble because we're not going to pay attention to these other things. Um, it seems obvious to me. I don't know why it's debatable. But, uh, you know, there are fine nuances to the way we do these things, what we want to preserve and conserve and protect, and what we want to uh, innovate and change and shift so that they're more sustainable, they're healthier for, for people. And also under recognizing that we need these outgroups because we don't live in a bubble, actually. The global network is there and it supports everything. If you want to experiment with uh, having a token economy in Idaho or somewhere and building a city-state, uh, or a sea, uh, sea city somewhere, you know, get, get Teal's money and build a floating city and have only people that th think like you, you know, my kind of people uh, moved here because we're my kind of people. And somehow uh, 
that's going to solve everything. I don't think it is because everything on this planet is literally interconnected. Just like the vagus nerve and your brain and your microbiome and your sinew and muscle and blood. I mean, uh, circulatory system versus everything else, right? It doesn't, you don't exist without all those complex systems working really brilliantly. And you can get back to the anthropic thing, but that's complicated too. So, uh, yeah, we evolved. We're here. Uh, we're the only species, to my knowledge, that talks to God or thinks about God or philosophizes or invents technology. I don't know any aliens and all that. So we really need to get our shit together. If we don't, that's okay. Uh, I think the shit will hit the fan and, and then we'll deal with it, right? I think potentially a lot of us could starve to death in the next 10 years, 10 or 20. And it's not just because the Bilderberg group, it's not just because uh, Bill Gates and nanotechnology or any of these things. It's because most of us didn't have the capacity to pay attention to all these complex things that are whirling around us. And we're easily manipulated, easily hacked. Uh, and so, you know, we just bounce from one thing to another. If you think that being a, a Catholic or Orthodox Christian or Muslim or whatever is all you need to do, look at the percentages of the population that believe in any of these things and then ask yourself, how, how, how deeply have they gone in to their worldview? As deeply as... Uh, Jay Dyer has gone into Orthodox Christianity. I mean, who reads that many books? Who can recite from memory passages from all these different authors <laughs> throughout the centuries? You know, uh, who thinks about the doctrine and the dogma and how it how it came about historically and so on and so forth? Much less memorizing the Bible or the Quran or something, and then being able to put that in, in a modern context with all of our problems, right? Every, everybody has different uh, ideas about how to square the circle, but it's going to be hard work and we're going to have to understand each other to do it, unfortunately. Uh, it's not going to be just as simple as getting your AR-15s out and killing the bad guys because uh, your militia isn't as powerful as the United States military. <laughs> you know, we look at what's going on in Ukraine. This is as real as it gets. Uh, you don't want to live that way. So I don't know, man. It could happen where we just float along thinking that if people believe, more people believe exactly what I believe, the world would be sorted out. But that's not going to happen. It, you know, there's just not going to be uh, five billion Orthodox Christians in the world in the next five, ten years. And in the meantime, California is burning. The oceans are acidifying. The sixth extinction is real. Yes, you do need the Amazon forest. You're not just a green freak, commie faggot. If you think that the Amazon rainforest and its habitat is important, <laughs> you're not crazy if you think that. But getting into the science of all these things is difficult. You're not a scientistic person. You, you don't believe in science. You're just trying to understand how, how nature works in various contexts, uh, how, it, how the systems work, and then learn from that and try to do something productive with that. You're not just a utilitarian freak if you say the hammer works it's got utilitarian value, therefore I can't be like uh, love beauty or something. And who had access to the fine arts back in the day? You know, it'd take you two, two days to walk to the castle market, and maybe if you got to go into the cathedral, you'd see something beautiful from some artist. But out at the farm, what's beautiful is just the light on the lake or that tree over there, or the way your children frolic in the grass or something, or maybe the light on your, 
your wife's uh, uh, neck. <laughs> That's beautiful. But um, you're not going to be talking about the opera or anything. Somehow we have to just kind of put ourselves in other people's lives and other people's perspectives just a tiny little bit and make an honest effort to understand what they're thinking and why they're thinking that way. And then we can maybe have a dialogue and come up with figuring out how we can connect with one another so that we can solve problems. Problems do exist, right? So they need to be solved. Anyway, probably gone on too, too long, but I'll show you this uh, in the next video. I want to go over this, this questionnaire or these points that um, Burnham talks about in The Suicide of the West. If you, if you mark all of those things with a, I agree, or you're a progressive maniac, and if you say you disagree, you're a reactionary maniac, and if you're somewhere in between, you're probably a conservative. But I want to go through this list and say, okay, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with that? Maybe you, somebody out there can tell me what's wrong with it. But um, trying to get these points of view uh, understood clearly and be able to debate or discuss or connect with these ideas so that we're not just being forced into these ridiculous, inefficient, insane culture wars that aren't going to get most of us anything, anywhere. Uh, well, well, all the wealth and all the material uh, capital goes to a, a fraction of a percent of the global population. A lot of what uh, people like Jay are concerned with, with Depop, Depop, defrag, you know, uh, is true. There, there are Mac, uh, people who have a Malthusian attitude about things and, you know, if the population doesn't decrease, but that's not, uh, most, uh, informed scientists don't think that, or many economists, many, uh, leaders don't believe that, but circumstances may force us into a depop thing if we don't get wise regardless of what uh, Schwab or some other dipshit at Davos talks about. And lots of the things that people talk about uh, in these organizations, they are real problems that do need real solutions. So yes, we created a lot of problems. Industrial Revolution and robber barons and... Uh, financialization, neoliberalism, on and on, technology. Yeah, it creates problems. It's a double-edged sword. It's not all good, not all bad. We have to deal with it. Uh, it is what it is. It's here. We have these issues. We have these problems. We've got to figure it out. Somebody has to kill the babysitter. Somebody has to figure out what to do with the, with the screens. You know, how can we use them so our children uh, benefit from them and don't get just destroyed by it. I don't like the singularity thing. I don't like this idea of having to be immortal in the, in this little sack of 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 bouillantiness. I think it's kind of vain and ridiculous, but that's my opinion. So these are the things I'm going to go into. Thanks for stopping by. Sorry for rambling. I just wanted to get something up there to let you know what I'm working on. I, I wrote a script. It turned out to be like a book or a long read. <laughs> and I, I'm trying to figure out now how to break it down into little bits and pieces that are coherent, tell a story that, that you're going to be interested in uh, looking at over the next, you know, 10 or 12 videos. Thank you very much. Please subscribe and uh, tell a friend. You don't have to share it. And write a comment. I always appreciate those. Bouliam T. Out.